Hello everyone, this is Ander Tonelli and I want to welcome you to Geared, the Model Guitar Workshop. We're going to have uh, a whole bunch of videos for you and we're going to explore all kinds of different things about the guitar and how to become a better musician and a better guitar player. So that means we're going to cover pretty much anything you can think of. We're going to cover chords, theory, we're going to talk about scales, technique and all kinds of cool stuff. The main idea behind this is to give you a foundation that you can use to explore, you know, depending on your goals and your level to explore different avenues. And uh, the main problem today we learn the guitar is that there's so much information and it's readily available to you. And uh, even though that's great, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a bit intimidating for a lot of people. Uh, when I started playing guitar about 20 years ago, there was no internet. And so the way we learned was to really just do anything we could to get just one tiny bit of information. So you would go to a friend's house who maybe was lucky enough to have guitar lessons and squeeze a chord out of him, you know, and then you would go to a concert and try to figure out what the guy was doing, where he was putting his fingers, actually, you know, what fret and what string. And this was be before camera phones, so you probably go home and have it all screwed up. And, but still, it forced you to make sense of what you had. And if you didn't have it, then you would have to make it up. So creating a voice on the instrument and uh, trying to have your own style was a lot easier. Nowadays, we have all the information we could ever want about the guitar, you know, one click away. But it's hard. It's hard to know, especially if your level is, you know, if you're not very good yet. It's really hard to know, well, is this going to move me in the right direction, you know, depending on what goals you have? Or is this actually useful? Is this guy on YouTube, uh, does he know what he's talking about? So you have all the information, but it's hard to, you know, to screen it. So hopefully with these videos, you have everything you need to then go out and uh, apply what you learn. So once you know how scales are made, then you can go out and learn more. Once you know how chords are built, you can go out and study more chords. Once you know how we improvise and how we deal with theory, then you can still go out and expand on all this. All right, so that's the main goal of this workshop. And today's first workshop is going to be about warm-ups to get you ready and, you know, to protect your hands. So we're going to take good care of that. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of theory, just a little bit, and uh, we'll play some guitar as well. All right, so then we'll be all set for the next videos. So without further ado, let's get right to it. All right, so warm-ups for your hands. One of the most important things that you can do when you play the guitar, and I guess a lot of you guys don't do it, so let me cover that real quick for you. Uh, the reason we do warm-ups is, there are many reasons, but the, the main thing is when you play live. If you play live, you don't control what happens the first few seconds you go on stage. Usually when you go on stage, actually, the first song is the most... Uh, powerful one usually or one of the big ones so that means if you're a guitar player you have quite a bit of playing to do and you have, might have a fast solo or if you're an instrumental musician then you have all the melodies and so your hands will go from zero to a hundred you know with no time to warm up now the problems with that you can make an analogy for any sport but let's say for example you like martial arts and so you go train and you start kicking stuff and people around without warm-ups what happens is most likely you'll get injured now a big muscle you'll notice right away that you you're injured, but the, the hands work a bit differently. They're really small and they only have tendons and very tiny bones. So what happens is you might have some discomfort, but the real pain, you it's chronic. So slowly you'll figure out that something is wrong with your hand and then you have a problem in the morning when it's cold. And tendinitis and uh, uh, repetitive stress disorders, you know, with somebody who plays the guitar and repeats the same pattern over and over is one of the most common problems. Now these problems, once they're chronic, it takes months or sometimes years to get over them if you're lucky, all right? So I don't want to scare you, but I just want to make sure that you understand the risks of playing and performing without warming up. Now, if you're at home, you might choose an exercise that you're really comfortable with and use that as warm-ups. But still, I'm going to give you a few routines that you can do either at home or before you hit the stage. And before we begin with the guitar warm-ups, we're going to start actually with simple hand exercises that you can use. And you can do these anywhere and whenever you want, although most likely you'll do them before a practice session or before a concert. All right, so let's get right to it. Five exercises for your hands. Okay, so the first exercise will warm up your wrists. You probably have seen people do this and that, you know, and all kinds of things. But to control it, you, all you have to do is clasp your hands together and then just start rotating really slow in the beginning and not too wide, all right? So just make it controlled and then you can go wider as you you warm up all right so maybe you can do 20 once one way and 20 the other all right so 
make sure you don't overdo it and this is very useful and it's really controlled you know compared to this or other exercises all right so 20 this way and you can then do 20 this way all right next and again for our wrists but this also covers your forearm you can just hold your hand up like this you can do both hands at the same time and then just simply move your hand up and then move it down up and down all right so this is very useful because you don't you're not actually don't do this you, you probably have seen a lot of people do this but this takes the control out of your hand and wrist and puts it in your other hand so that's pretty dangerous so make sure you do it with your own arm all right so whichever wrist you're using use the same arm to do it so you'll build a bit of strength in your forearms and also you'll have a lot more control again do about 20 each way you know so that this will be one two three and so on do it with both hands you can do them at the same time and so let's move on to the next exercise. All right, so after we worked on our forearms and our wrists, we're going to move on to uh, the hand and the bigger tendons and muscles in the hand. So all we have to do is open our hands and close them. Right? It's very simple. Again, we can do it about 20 or 30 times, you know, depending on how you feel that day. Um, it's very important that you actually open your hands quite a bit but don't overdo it, right? It's not about increasing your flexibility, just warming up the hand. But still you should feel a bit of a stretch as you open. And then also close with a bit of strength, okay? So open and close. Again, do this about 20 or 30 times. Okay, this next one is, uh, again, kind of deals with everything at the same time, forearms, wrists, and fingers. And it's very simple, and you might have seen people do this. Again, the, the active way of doing it is this. So this away takes away control from your hand. So if you, you know, if you're cold or if you haven't done this a lot, you might injure yourself. So again, we do this by controlling what we do with our with the actual hand that gets stretched. So put your hands together like this and just slowly stretch one way and the other. You should feel a bit of tension in the ins on the inside of your hand and a bit here. So if you if you don't feel it, you can stretch just a bit more. Okay, like this. This is the fourth exercise. I'm going to give you one more, and then we'll be ready to pick up the guitar. And finally, we can do one more exercise. This is more for the fingers, and it's not actually a stretch. So it's a little massage, and we'll do it from the tip of the finger. We'll do it on all fingers, but let's start with the index finger. And with tiny circular motions, we just run down the finger, the whole finger. Okay, then we go to the next, to the next. And so on. we do it with all five fingers and then we change hands and we do it on the next. Now it's important that you don't do it from the, you know, outwards. Don't do it that way because then you'll build, your blood will just get trapped here and it's not the way to do it. So just start from the tip of the finger and give it a little massage towards the center of the hand. Okay, just, you know, a couple of minutes and you'll be good to go. Now if you're playing live, just one more piece of advice and maybe you are a bit scared or maybe uh, it's cold backstage and then it's going to be hot on stage and you want to warm up your hands don't use tap water because then it will be kind of weird you feel like your hands fell asleep so what you can do is just clench your fingers in your hands uh, very tight breathe in then clench your fingers and your, your wrist your fists and then as you exhale open your hands and do it again four seconds air in Four seconds you hold it with your fists clenched, and then four seconds you breathe out and you open your hands and relax. Repeat it a few times and you'll be all set to go. All right, so we're ready to begin with the first exercise that we actually get to play on. And uh, these are all warm ups, but they're also uh, exercises that are good to improve a certain aspect of your playing. So in this case, you can use this also to improve finger independence and also to change the focus of your hand. Uh, if you've been uh, playing for a while, you have noticed that you prefer certain fingers to others. And 99.9% .9 of all guitar players uh, choose the first finger and the second finger as the main ones, and then they leave the ring finger and the little finger as kind of afterthought. And once in a while, they just shoot one out and hope for the best, right? So we don't want that. We want to be able to play pretty much anything we, we, that comes up in our heads. So that means we don't know exactly where that will be on the instrument. Uh, if we want to play a certain chord, maybe it's a bit of, of a complicated chord, and we want to be able to control this finger just as much as we control this. 
All right, so uh, one way to do it is to actually do exercises that switch the focus from these two fingers to the final two. And one good way to do it is to use uh, different finger combinations. Now, having four fingers, most of us, that, that we can actually play on the guitar with, we have a total of 24 different combinations that we can use with, with these four fingers. So if we call the fingers one, two, three, and four, what we can do is actually play one, two, three, four, like this. But we could play maybe one, two, four, three. Okay? Then we could play one, three, two, four. One, three, four, two, and so on. So later on, I'll show you a table with all the different permutations. Um, the point of this is that once we, when we begin with this first finger, our focus, if we're not quite familiar and trained with it, is going to be on this finger. So we might actually end up playing like this. You know, this you notice my, the weight of the hand is all resting on the first finger. We might play like this, which same problem. Now the, the little finger has almost no say in what we're going to do next, right? So if we get caught and we have to use it, we'll do some weird stuff like this. Um, when we progress through the combinations, we'll find different ones, maybe three, two, four, one. Okay, so now you see I can't I can play this in this position. Now this forces me to, to give an equal share of attention to all my fingers. If I'm playing uh, four, I don't know, four, two, three, one, I need this finger always ready and always in the right position because this is the one that actually changes strings and moves all the other ones. All right, so this is the main utility of this, uh, of this exercise, but since you can play it very slow and it doesn't require any stretches, you can actually do a very good uh, warm-up exercise out of it. All right, so um, let me show it to you from close-up. I'm just going to pick a few combinations, and uh, the, the way you should practice it is to use a metronome and play very slow and maybe repeat each progression, I'm sorry, each combination a few times. All right, so four is a good number. When you're done with that, move to the next string. It's four. And you keep going like this. Okay, you get all the way to the first string. And we go back up. And all the way up. Now you should play much slower than this. Uh, this is uh, just so you get an idea and we don't take an hour to make this video, all right? So let me show it to you from close up. I'm gonna show you a few different combinations and, uh, and then I'm gonna show you a table with all the actual permutations you can use and you can make up your own schedule with it. All right.
Okay, so now that we've seen how we do it from close up, we're going to actually have a look at all the possible permutations of uh, these fingerings. So, uh, one, two, three, four really only means the fingers. You can do it anywhere you want on the neck. So, uh, fret five is actually very good because it's a kind of a comfortable position for your left hand and your arm. You know, sometimes people, depending on the guitar you have, the neck might be all the way out here. So, the first fret might be a bit uncomfortable. So, you can do it here. Uh, if you have small hands or maybe you're tired, you can do it all the way, you know, uh, higher up on the neck, maybe on the ninth fret from 9 to 12 or 7, you know, whatever works for you, 5 is a good place. So when you see on the table 1, 2, 3, 4, that's just the fingers, all right? So in this case, we'll have to be like 5, 6, 7, 8, all right? And as we said before, you find all kinds of combinations, there's 24 of them, and the focus of each group of 6 will be on a separate fingers. And uh, what else should you know? Well, one thing you have to keep in mind is that you should be light on the strings, okay? So when you play one combination, let's do five, seven, six, eight. As soon as I play one of the frets, I can just move on to the next one, all right? I don't try to hold the fingers down. I just do it like this, okay? Very light and no rush, you know, do it very slow and just use it to warm up and to get to know your fingers and your hand. All right, very good. I hope that worked out for you. And so we're gonna add one more layer of uh, difficulty here, which again, you should play this always very slow. Don't forget what you're doing. You're just warming up. And if you're already warmed up, what you're doing is trying to build a bridge between your brain and your fingers. So don't rush it, you know, play very slow. Uh, this next exercise is uh, similar in, the, you know, in, in, in scope to the one before, in the sense that we're gonna use all four fingers across all the strings, but we're gonna add one more difficulty here. And we're gonna change strings very often. Okay, so I'm just gonna play really slow for you so you get an idea of what we're doing. So we're building these diagonal shapes across the neck. And what this forces you to do is to be even more uh, free with your fingers. Before you could kind of tense your way through this, you know, even if it was more complicated fingerings, you could kind of press your fingers very hard, down very hard, and, you know, fight with your hand until you figure it out. Now, you can't quite do it here, because here you have to be agile. As you move across the fretboard. All right, so the idea here is that you start with the uh, first finger on fret 5, and then from there, you start building these diagonal shapes. Don't worry about it, we're going to have a tab uh, for you and a close-up really, really soon. But the main focus here should be on this hand. We haven't discussed the picking hand yet. This is gonna be on one of the next videos. So do what you can for now. The only advice I will give you is try to alternate between a downstroke and an upstroke. And then just work your way up the neck. Okay, so before you kind of uh, worried about giving 25% of your attention to each finger, all right? Not giving 80 to this one, 20 to this one, and zero to this two. Now, you still have to do that, but you also have to relax your hand, okay? There's no way you're gonna be able to do this if you tense up, okay? So let me show it to you from close up and you'll get a better idea. There's two ways of doing this, by the way. One is starting with your first finger. One is starting with your ring finger. I'm sorry, the little finger. It's a bit more difficult. We're gonna show them to you both from close up.
right, so next we're going to look at one more thing you need to learn and that you can use also as a warm-up, which is uh, finger separation. When uh, we study so far, what we studied is a way of, you, you know, being relaxed and uh, controlling four fingers at the same time. But when you actually play on the instrument, because of the actual uh, construction of the instrument, you're going to be facing um, a few basic positions with your fingers. And usually you can, you can kind of work your way through the instrument just by using one, one uh, finger per fret, okay? So you might get away with just, you know, using your hand like this. But depending on what notes you play and what scales and what alterations to the scale and what chords, you're going to have to develop a certain uh, flexibility with your fingers so that you can open the position and reach more than the four frets that you would be allowed to reach just by playing like this. Uh, usually you'll be facing uh, just the stretches of one fret, so that's what we're going to look at today. Uh, if you want to do more of this, then you can try two frets. Just one word of advice, again, I'll play around the fifth fret. If you're not comfortable here, just don't feel bad about it, you know, just move your way up. Go to the twelfth fret, it's a lot easier to stretch, and then work your way down, okay? You don't have to do it here to feel good about, you know, your guitar playing, just do it where it's good. Especially if you are a cold when you're starting out, the day or your practice, do it uh, somewhere comfortable. Ninth fret, seventh, fifth, whatever. Okay, so let's see what we can do here. Uh, there's three spots where we can actually stretch our fingers. One is between the fifth fret, uh, the, the first finger, sorry, and the second finger, which if we translate it to uh, the, the 24 combinations, it would be something like this. For the first combination, we'll be playing one, two, three, four, but we're gonna leave a gap here of one fret between the first and second finger. Like this. Any other combination, we can do the same. Let's say we're playing three, two, four, one. That's okay, we play three, two, four, and then one. Always leaving this gap. Now, as we said before, we don't want to move our hand around to just fit one finger. So don't do this. Uh, let's go back to five, seven, and nine. Don't do this. Okay, don't allow your first finger or whatever finger to follow the others. It's a matter of actually stretching the hand. So even if you lift the finger, stay in position, all right? You don't want to go running about the guitar fretboard chasing fingers, all right? So hold your hand in the right position and do something like that. All right, so that's one. Uh, the second separation is between, we're just going in order of difficulty, so this was the easiest one. The next harder one is uh, separating the ring finger and the little finger. And so we could do something like this. Five, six, seven, nine. Not just a bit harder, although you'll be surprised as how far you can stretch these two fingers. Okay? And then finally, the most difficult one. This, I'm really serious, don't do it here if you're not comfortable, move it up. But the idea is to stretch between the second finger and the third one. Again, without doing this, okay? So we don't chase the fingers, we just open the hand as much as we can, okay? Um, this will also work out, uh, sorry, this will also fix one of the problems that most people have, which is that they tend to as they go down the strings, they tend to rotate the, the wrist. And usually this is also accompanied by the, the thumb going up. But even if you don't and you end up playing like this, you'll see that you just can't quite do this right. Okay, it's gonna be a lot, you know, a lot more difficult. So this hopefully will teach you to play in proper position. Okay, so I'm gonna show it to you from close up now. We pick a few different combinations. Uh, showing you from close up the separation from the first and second, third and fourth, and second and third fingers. All right, check it out.
I have one more exercise for you, and uh, this has to do with chords. Uh, you might have noticed a lot of people, and maybe you're doing that, uh, you know, when you practice and when you perform, you change chords sometimes by moving one finger at a time, and you're kind of fishing around for the right fret and the right finger. Now the problem with it, so maybe you do something like this, you play C, and then when you go to G, for example, you go like this, and then you go to D. Right now the problem with this is obvious, you know, whatever value the chord has as a note, so let's say it has to, it's a, it's a quarter note, right? So we have one, two, three, four, and by the next one we have to be here already. Now if I take, if it takes me a long time to switch from one chord to the next, I'll be eating up, you know, chord time. So I can do one, two, three, four, and I can do this and get there late, but then I'm out of time, or I can do this, one, two, three, four, one. So the, the time that, I, that it takes me to change chords, I'm taking away from the actual chord. Right, so that's pretty unacceptable. And uh, the solution to it is to actually move your hand at the same time, so that it takes only one split second to change. So if now my chord lasts for a quarter note, one, two, three, four, I'm giving that chord the right value of its note, all right? So if it's a quarter note, I'm actually hearing that chord for a whole quarter note. Now, th there's many ways to, you can improve it. One of them, of course, is to just play and try to focus on it. But uh, let's look at one cool exercise that we can use also as a warm-up. We're gonna put our fingers in a very strange position and create some really strange chords, and they sound kind of weird. And the good thing about these chords, it's, they're awkward to play. Okay, so we start from the 5th fret, 4th string, 1st finger, then we put the 3rd finger on the 6th fret of the 3rd uh, strings, then the 2nd string will be 5th fret with the, third, with the 2nd finger, and then the little finger will go on the 7th fret of the 1st string. Again, don't worry about it too much, we're going to have close-ups and tabs for all the exercises. So once I have this here, I just play it. As I play it, I assign a value to it. Let's just do quarter notes, right? So I'm playing one, and then I try to switch to a different chord. Let me get rid of the echo for you. And then I switch and play this other one. And then do this, and do this. Now, as you can see, my, my second position is kind of a mirror image of the first one. So that ensures that I'm actually moving my fingers around as much as possible. And I, the point is doing this, okay? So you play, you switch, you play, and you switch. Now these, these fingerings are very, very strange to play if you go around fishing for the chords, okay? Because of the way they're, they're set up. So it forces you to really do it in the air, prepare your fingers in the right position, and then go down. And you keep doing this for about an hour, okay? Once you control this, we can move them vertically and horizontally. So let's try the vertical thing first. We're gonna play it on the first group of four, that's between the first string and the fourth. Then we move up one string. So we'll be playing from the fifth string to the second. And it sounds really weird. And then we do it from the sixth to the third. You can just do that up and down for a few times. Uh, once you're comfortable with it, you can do it horizontally. So we start on the first fret, and we do it once. On each fret, all the way up, and then all the way down. I'm, do, I'm playing with my fingers now, if you notice, but you can do it with a pick too, right? So you can just... It's no problem, whatever you want to use. All right, let me show it to you from close up.
So I've given you a few exercises already, and we're going to do a lot more in the next videos. And I've talked about, you know, follow the metronome, use a metronome, and I'm going to do that a lot more later on. So let's see how we actually use a metronome. Exercises usually fall in two categories. Usually you have subdivisions of uh, a beat in one, two, and four notes per beat. And sometimes you use triplets. That's pretty much all you're going to find for exercises. Now, of course, if you're actually performing or you're studying a piece of music, this will be very strange. Usually pieces of music have uh, variation in subdivisions and uh, stuff like that. But for exercises, you should be pretty fine with what I'm giving you now. So uh, let's take, for example, the exercise we did before with the separate combinations. We're going to have five, six, seven, eight, say, as an example. One good way to do this would be, and a natural way to do it, would be one note per beat. One, two, three, four. And then we go up and up in, in speed. And then we might try to do two notes per beat. So it would sound like this. One and two and three and four and. So same four beats, but I'm playing twice as many notes. And then if I'm really doing great, I might actually do four notes per beat. It would sound something like this. One, two, three, four. Okay? And also this is more, uh, it's actually much more intelligent than just going one, two, three, four, and speeding up the metronome until we're doing one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. That's not very realistic. There's not a lot of pieces of music that go that fast. Okay, so that's one way to do it. If we have triplets, which is another very common subdivision, we'll probably go from playing one note per second. Let's do uh, five, seven, eight only. So we do one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. But eventually we'll want to play the, the whole group within one beat, and it will sound something like this. One, two, three, like that. Okay, so um, I'm going to give you a table now that you can use to not only uh, learn how to use a metronome, but also to, to make charts if you want, or just follow your progress, because if you take notes on what speed you're playing every day, you'll see that hopefully you're improving. All right, so there's two main subdivisions, as we said. We can look at uh, groups of notes of four, or groups of notes of three. Let's look at the first one. So we start, uh, the metronome is 60 BPMs, that means 60 bits per minute, which is the same as one note per second. So we'll play quite slow and follow along with the metronome. If we can play great, and uh, you have to set a number of repetitions for what you consider to be acceptable. I used to do 10 times an exercise, perfect, then I could go up. Okay, so let's say you play five times and it's good enough for you. Then you go up to 70, and you play the same exercises, but just a tiny bit faster. Now the trick here is that it's not fast enough for your fingers to notice. Okay, so you're tricking your fingers into thinking that you're doing the same thing as before. That will help keep your hand relaxed. And then when you're good at 70, you go up to 80, then 90, then 100. You go all the way up to 120. Uh, 120 is already a pretty respectable speed, and uh, so what we do then is go back to 60, and instead of playing one per beat, you play two per beat. So the actual speed is the same. Instead of playing one, two, three, four, you're playing one and two and three and four and same speed. But now the difficulty is to actually play two notes per beat and to do it in a very, very precise way. So we don't do one and two and three or anything like that. We actually play one and two and three and four and exactly the same as when we were playing one upper beat. So now we go up again, we play 10 times, perfect, we go up to 65. We don't go up to 17, there will be a lot of difference between before and now. So we go 65, 70, 75, 80, all the way up again to 120. Once we get to 120, we go uh, one and two and three and four and one and two and again, we go back to 60 and play four notes per beat. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. But the beats will be like this. One, two, three, four. Okay, and now that we're again playing a 60, we'll go up 63, 66, 69, 72, and you know, however far you get. All right, so this is for uh, groups of four. If we play groups of three, we do the same thing, but we start one note per beat at 60 BPMs. We go all the way up to 180, not 120. We go all the way up to 180 then go back to 60, and this time play three notes per beat, 60, 65, 70, 75, and so on. All right, so you should be able to go through pretty much all these videos just by using this table.
All right, there's one more thing we should do as we warm up, and it's to actually warm up our ear. When uh, most guitar players, we, we are overzealous with the technical part of playing, so we, we play a lot and we practice a lot of scales and we practice a lot of technique, and we kind of forget that music is uh, not um, so much a physical art as, you know, it actually it's an earring art, and so we should really know what we're doing, and the best way to do it is to train your ear. And there's many ways to do it, but we'll, I'll drop a few hints here and there during the videos, especially when we learn chords and uh, scales and different modes. So before we get to that, let's do a, a little bit of an exercise that you can use to open up your ear. It's very simple. So you just pick up your guitar and you just play two notes at the same time. Okay, that's it. That's all you have to do. And try to, instead of hearing this blob of music or of noise, try to hear both notes. The lower one and the higher one, right? But don't do this, okay? So this is, you only do this when you've already sung what you're playing. So if you do it long enough, you'll actually be able to hear two different frequencies. The low one, and the high one, right? And then you move around and you do it again, just randomly. And you just make sure you're doing it right. Do it all over the fretboard, don't worry about if, if it's too high to sing, just sing it an octave lower. You know, if you, if you can't reach here, sing it, instead of singing these two notes, uh, just sing it as if you were here. It's the same actual information, oh, sorry, there. Uh, it's the same actual information, so you have no problems. And if it's, if it's strange to you, just stay in the area where you can sing. You know, I have a limited range, so I just stick around this area, and that's fine. So again, just play two notes. Try to hear the low one and the high one, and then when you think you have them, sing them. And only later, you check. And if you got it wrong, no problem, just move to another section and do it again, and do it again, and again, and again. Do this 10 or 15 times, uh, uh, 10 or 15 minutes every day, and uh, you won't believe the changes in your hearing. All right? Do it. There's one more thing we have to do today, and it's called the interval table. And what this is, is really just a way to understand music as distance between notes, and not necessarily what actual notes you're playing. One good example is this. Imagine that I play these two notes. You already know what this is, right? Everybody knows what this is. Now imagine that instead of playing it here, I play two frets up. Or maybe I play two strings down. Oh, sorry. There you go. So if I play all this stuff, most of us don't really know which one is the right one. You know, we, Beethoven might have written it in D, might have done it in E, or maybe easy F sharp. Okay, it, it doesn't really matter. What matters is the actual distance between the notes. And these distances are called intervals. Uh, it works the same way in chords. So if I play a chord that's uh, something like this, it doesn't matter if I play it here or here. It's the same quality of the chord. So I can move it anywhere I want, but as long as I respect the distances between the notes, I get the same feel and the same actual sound. But instead of moving it around like that, what if I just change one finger? It's a drastic difference, right? From this to this. Okay, so what really defines sound is the distance between different sounds. Uh, understanding this is key to learning, because otherwise you'll have to memorize every single scale, every single chord, every single, uh, everything you do, you have to memorize it everywhere on the neck, and you'll still be guided only by your fingers and not by your ear. So one way to understand this is to use this uh, interval table, which goes like this. We have a total of 12 notes, and we all know that. So there's seven natural notes, which are C, D, E, e uh, C, D, E, F, G, A, B. That's basic music knowledge. And then between some of the no these notes, we have other notes that are called the sharps and flats. And these are between C and D, D and E, F and G, G and A, and A and B. Uh, we can call these notes, there are alterations between these two natural notes, we can call them with the name of the previous note, in this case will be C to C sharp. So you can think of a sharp as a plus one, you know, from C. Or we can call it D flat, so we take the name of the next note and just subtract one. On the guitar is very simple. So if I take this C, I can go up, C sharp, or I can call it D flat. I go to D, 
then I can call this D sharp or E flat. E, F, nothing in between these two. F sharp or G flat. G, G sharp or A flat. A, A sharp or B flat. B, and then again without any other notes in between, C. As you see, I've gone from fret 3 to fret 15, so it's 12 frets. So it all makes sense. Now, um, as you have noticed, there's 12 notes, but when we reach the, the same note again, we call it an octave. I don't know if you if you know a little bit of theory, just a little bit, you'll know that C and C are one octave apart. So how do we fit 12 notes into eight intervals? And so this is where the, ta the interval table comes in handy. As you can see, we have seven qual quantities for intervals. That's very simple. If you want to know what distance there is between C and G, all you have to do is just count C, D, E, F, and G. So it's a fifth. Okay. If you want to know what the difference is between uh, the distances between B and D, B, C, D. That's a third. So the quantity is very simple. You just count it, and that's it. Now, what's hard to understand is, well, what kind of D is it? Is it a D flat? Is it a D sharp? Is it a natural D? What is it? And so that's how we started the table. The table tells you that seconds, thirds, sixths, and sevenths come in minor and major. Then there's a perfect fourth and the perfect fifth, and between them there's augmented fourth and diminished fifth. And this sounds like a lot, but again, look at it as if it were a fretboard. What you do is go from one note to the one right after it. We don't skip any notes. So if the root is C, my minor second has to be a D flat. Why not C sharp? Well, because we already counted the quantity. Quantity is C, D. So the second is a D. But it has to be a D flat because we want to keep that sequence of one single note for each fret. Okay, so we have C, D flat. Now, if we want to know what the major second is, all we have to do is just keep going. From D flat, we go up one note, which is D. Now, if we go one more note up, we'll find thirds. So first of all, we just make sure that we call it C, D, E. We don't call it a, a, a D, we call it an E. And so C, D, E flat, that's a minor third. We keep going E, we move to the fourth, F, and so on all the way through. That's all you need to know for now. So here's a table, and we're going to have it full screen for you. You should copy this table a bunch of times, print it out, and then make every day make two or three copies. All right, so the first times you do it, you start from the root, and you just fill it out one by one. And as you learn more, what you do is you do it randomly. So you take D and you go to the fifth and you try to figure that one out without using the incrementally, you know, the incrementals from before. So you do, you do C, the fifth is G. And then if I want the major third of B, I know it's a D sharp. And if I want the, man, the minor third of F, it's an A flat and so on. Do it every day, two or three times. And if something's not clear about it, just keep doing it and it will become clear. And if it doesn't, we're going to look at this throughout these videos. So by the end of them, you'll be fine. All right? One of the best things you can do for yourself as a guitar player is to actually learn every note on the fretboard. Uh, this becomes vital when you improvise and you compose, and also it becomes very useful when you learn new stuff like scales and chords, because you don't have to memorize, you know, a whole lot of configurations and patterns and all that. You do it once, and then you just move it up and down the neck. Okay, so let's, uh, sometimes people will tell you that you should go from the first fret, learn them in order, but that's kind of weird because when you get here, you kind of forget what the first ones were and so on. So the best way I found that, it, that you can use to learn it is to just learn one note at a time. So let's say we start with E. All you have to do is, without a metronome, without anything, just really slow, play E, then figure out where the next one is. In this case, it's really easy because we have an open string, so 12 frets more, that's 12. And then you will play 24. If you have 24 frets, if you have 21 or 22, just move to the next one. But if you have 24 frets, play the 24th fret. And then on the next string, you find an E again and you play. Now, uh, if you don't know where an E is, remember that we said that the guitar is made so that each fret is one note. So all you have to do is just count. A string, you go A sharp, B, C, C sharp, D, D sharp, E. And you find your E on the seventh fret. So now you can play seven and then 12 frets more. That's the 19th fret. And then you can do the same thing with the fourth string, second and 14th. 
9, 21, uh, 5, 17, 0, 12, and 24. If it's hard for you to do this, just take your time, take a tab, and just write down the notes. So write down 0, 12, 24, 7, 19, and so on. Memorize it, and then do it. So don't worry about the tempo too much, but if you are comfortable with it, get a metronome, maybe play one note per second, you know. Go like that. More or less, you know, it doesn't matter how fast you play. It's important though that if you screw up, okay, then you start away again from the beginning. That way we don't leave any fret, you know, with less knowledge than any other one. When you are ready with E, what you do is go down this, the same notes as the strings, you know, so if the guitar is tuned E, A, D, G, B, E, you'll do A next. Okay, so you'll do all the A's. Again, if you're not sure what you're doing, take out a fretboard diagram, write down where the A's are, and then memorize them. The reason we don't do them in order, we don't do C, D, E, F, G, is that otherwise you'll be using the notes you already know to kind of fill in the gaps, right? So if we know E and we move straight to F, some of you will go like, well, that's just one fret more. And that kind of takes away from the exercise. The idea is you can get on to any note at any time. And if you need an F, you might not be coming from an E. You might be coming from a C, and you have to know where they are. And so do it like this, follow the string, so E, A, uh, D, G, B, and then go to F maybe, and then to C. Then you have all the natural notes, and then you just fill in the gaps with, uh, with the sharps and flats. Or I do this again, five, ten minutes every day, in a few weeks you'll be way beyond what most guitar players um, are doing with, with their instrument, all right? <laughs>